and welcome to the virtual edition of our year-round screening series, Film Independent Presents, and this Q&A for the Magnolia Pictures Documentary Collective. I'm Jen Wilson, Senior Programmer with Film Independent. Uh, before we get started, I have to give some praise to our supporters. Thank you to our incredible lead sponsor, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, and our screening partners, Vision Media. For those of you watching live, please take advantage of the question box at the bottom of your screen and submit some questions for me to ask our guests towards the end of the Q&A today. And now please welcome the director of Collective, one of the most widely discussed documentaries of 2020, Alexander Nano. Hi there. Thank Hello. You for um, so I usually like welcome. I usually like to start with a um, with a, a filmmaker origin story question, just because so many of our members are aspiring filmmakers and aspiring filmmakers. Um, do you want to talk about how you became a documentary filmmaker? Yeah. So um, I started out, you know. Wanted to do film since I was 14. Um, I went to film school, but I also worked in, in theater. Uh, and it was basically in film school where I discovered, uh, let's say, my passion for observational documentary filmmaking. So, you know, seeing the, the pioneers of uh, documentary with of observational filmmaking, like Robert Drew and the Maisel brothers and the Weissman, basically. Um, that was the point where I, I knew that's the way I want to do films. So for Collective, um, this is uh, one of the most fascinating documentaries I've ever seen, especially because you seemed to get involved in making the film right when all of these things were unfolding. It feels like we're watching everything unfold in real time. How was it that you began when you began or when did when did you become interested in um the collective fire scandal uh pretty pretty fast after the, the fire because what the fire started in romania was basically you know uh, a young generation really took the streets instantly after the fire uh and it was for the first time since the revolution in in 89 that so many, you know, that the young generation came forward and said, we had enough of the, of the old corrupt and populistic political class. Um, and it was clear that, you know, I wanted to, to understand through filmmaking in a way what is happening, but as I'm doing observation filmmaking, I also was looking for characters to follow uh, and uh, through whose eyes I could tell the story. And so, in parallel to that, what happened was this mass manipulation of the authorities and the healthcare system that they can treat all these burn patients and that the Romanian healthcare system is on top of it and is one of the best there is in Europe. And um, they prohibited the, the burn patients to be flown out to proper burn units and they started to die in hospitals. So it was clear that uh, there was a story that has to be told and I really wanted to understand the relationship between power and citizens. Uh, and once, because most of the press failed in the first days to really ask the right questions and only propagated what, what the officials were saying. Uh, it was this team of journalists around Kathleen Tolontan that were the first to uncover the lies and uncovered that the death of the burn patients in the Romanian hospitals is more than just because they were burned. It was because infections they caught in the, in the hospital. So we contacted, contacted the, the, the journalists and um, you know, asked permission to shadow their work. So uh, one, of the, one of the reasons um, this seems to unravel so quickly is because they do get a lot of people to come forward and talk about what's going on you know, inside the disinfecting company and um, later on all kinds of doctors and nurses coming forward talking about the conditions in the hospital. Why do you think so many people were so willing to come forward and talk about what was going on? I think first of all because it was uh, a national tragedy it felt like the whole country is part of it like everybody was connected to, uh, to this uh, and the surprising element was that the journalists were basically sports journalists. 
uh, and they were at the same time investigative journalists that had a long experience over 25 years in investigative journalism, but they investigated the sports world. So they brought down sports ministers that went to jail. They brought down the big football bosses. Uh, but that gave the whistleblowers in a way, um, you know, that made the whistleblowers trust them uh, because they knew that they are not partisan. You know, sports journalists have this ability that they have to position themselves in between the teams. They don't, you know, they're not partisan. And I think that contributed a lot to the, to the fact that they were approached mostly by the, by the whistleblowers. So what happens um, after you get involved with the, with the journalist and uh, Catalan, his name is Catalan Tolantan, right? Yes. Tolantan, right. Mm -hmm. uh, the, main, the main journalist that we see um, is that uh, when the Minister of Health resigns, uh, Vlad Wojcielewski, Voiculescu yeah. Voy uh, takes over and you seem to immediately have had access to his his office and, and him and, and his staff. How did that come about that he decided to let you film him during the middle of this? So basically when uh, the other one came down, the, the, the basically the investigation took down the, the first uh, health minister was C. I heard rumors that this young patients activist who was not uh, involved in politics was interviewed for the job. And I thought that might be the chance to, to get a look into the system to, you know, to change the trenches and tell the same story from inside the system. And so I tried to contact him and after a week or so I, I managed to uh, obtain a meeting with him. Um, and I met a young man that was, you know, that had already a, a young team around him. And he told me that uh, transparency is basically what they are all championing for. Uh, and um, he knew he was confronting a really rigid, corrupt system. Uh, and he said something like, you know, there's no reason uh, for the healthcare system to have secrets because healthcare is a basic constitutional right of citizens and they have all the rights to know what decisions are taken here and upon which criteria. Um, so he had this courage to let me in, but at the same time he said, you have to be aware that this whole ministry will want to kill both of us when you come in here. So. Um, then we agreed that he would never tell me to, to stop the camera that I would be free to film whatever I want, but for sure asking, you know, third parties if they agree to be filmed. Uh, and because the pressure and this also revelations and uh, the attacks were so harsh, uh, it made it possible for observation documentary to really, um, you know, capture things as they were happening in the most authentic way because nobody, you know, could take care anymore of, you know, that I was there with my camera filming things. Now, was, was Vlad appointed by the government as, as the replacement for the former minister or was he elected? No, he was, uh, he, he was named. Uh, so there was this, um, let's say, technocrat government, government of um, specialists in a way, uh, which recognized, I guess, that the only way to um, absorb the anger of, of, uh, of the society towards the healthcare system would be to appoint somebody from the civil society, more or less, a patient's activist. But I don't think that they ever um, thought that he might become a danger to the system, that he might be really dodged in a way to, uh, you know, to, to reform the system. Yeah, I, I when 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 he shows up, uh, you know, uh, at that first press conference, I sort of had this feeling like, oh, you know, this guy, he's so soft spoken. Mm -hmm. He's so nice. He's not, you know, trying to do any devil speak or dodge anybody or tell any, or, you know, he says, you know, we're here because we want to stop lying. 
And I was like, this seems impossible that this guy got employed to this job. That's, it's one of the most amazing things about the story that, that that guy got that job and that he did what he did. Um, is, is, so is Vlad still in position there as minister or did, did, did somebody else take over that job? Oh, that, that's so basically uh, his mandate was for about six months because the main mandate of the whole uh, Technoka government was for one year. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> then the elections came as one can see in the film and the social democrats came into power which are known for being very populistic and, and corrupt. Uh, and, you know, they tried to dismantle the judicial system and the whole, you know, all institutions people were replaced with incompetent people that would serve them. Uh, but what happened later on is that um, new parties started like made out of young people who came out of private businesses and who realized if we want to, uh, you know, to build a modern society, let's say, that serves its citizens, we have to become involved. So these new parties was, were formed, and two years ago, Vlad joined one of these parties, and we had elections uh, not long ago, and now this new party is part of a coalition government where they also have some ministries, and Vlad became again last Christmas uh, Minister of Health. So he's back in the ministry. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with very many American politicians, but I view him as as the AOC of <laughs> of Romania. Yeah, uh, yeah. Alexandria Ocasio Cortez is yes, what yeah, is yeah. one of our Congress people who was, you know, whenever she was elected, people were amazed because we were just like, we never thought we would see any politicians like this or that anybody like this person wanted to be a politician. Um, yeah. So this, this scandal, just, I mean, it's so deep, it, it goes to, you know, your highest level of government. Um, was, before this happened, was there like a general knowledge that this was the way things were being run in Romania or was it shocking? So the general knowledge was that everybody knows that bribes are paid in Romanian hospitals. It's a former communist country that, you know, comes with this culture in the healthcare system where doctors take bribes from, from patients, uh, where bribes would, uh, you know, provide you preferential uh, uh, treatment. But in a way, nobody, it was a shock also for us because nobody really understood the deep lack of humanity that was um, or so, so deeply engraved in, in, in the healthcare system. And as, as you can see in the film, the fact that people really have no problem with, you know, knowing that they can't treat these patients, uh, diluting disinfectants and, and uh, you know, doing business between the hospitals and, and this manufacturer, uh, this is something that nobody expected. It's, it's just beyond imagination, you know, because they did it for 10 years. The Secret Service was informing the political sphere about it and they kept doing it. Um, it's, I don't want to use two big words, but it resembles in a way genocide because you know that diluted disinfectants will create hospital bacteria that is killing patients. Yeah, I mean, you get a, during the interviews with the doctors and the nurses, you, you get a real sense of hopelessness when they're talking about this because, you know, what they're saying is no one cares. You know, when, when they're confronted with the video of the patient with the maggots in the wound, and they're just basically like, this is, ha you know, this is happening out in the open and everybody knows about it here at the hospital and no one cares. And, um, and then the doctor, when, when she's talking to Vlad, goes on to say all the doctors are asking to be assigned to surgeries because that's where you make the highest bribes. Do you have to pay a bribe to survive a complicated surgery in Romania? Sometimes, sure, sometimes. But I think it just shows, 
what corruption really means. You know, it's for sure it starts from the top, uh, but you know, it goes down to you know to verses. Even in Romania, sometimes you even have to pay bribes to the uh, guard in front of the hospital to you know to be friendly and let you in. Uh, but what is so shocking is that. And what one has to understand is that corruption in the healthcare system means really to put people in the situation to pay money when they are the most vulnerable. You basically take away from them when they're the most vulnerable. And the fact that no one cares, you can just see it, for example, uh, <clears throat> in the States, you know, when now under uh, the uh, administration that goes now out, the way of um, incompetence and the way that they really do not and did not care about human lives. Just imagine that this administration in the state would have had, uh, you know, uh, not Dr. Fauci there, but somebody who had just, you know, done anything the president would say. Uh, and then that would go down like, you know, populists and corrupt people always do the same thing. They replace in all state institutions professionals with incompetent people because incompetent people serve you forever. They would never have gotten that positions in their lives. So they will serve you. So the longer something like that goes on in Romania, this kind of politics went on for a long time, the, you know, the more Ill it will infiltrate and you could see it in the States. It takes four years to dismantle the state. This, uh, this documentary has, has ended up resonating with American audiences to you know, a very high level. People really like this documentary here. Have you thought about why that is, why it's so popular with Americans? Um, you know, it's not only really Americans. We, we had the same reactions all over the world. And it was also for us, uh, although we understood while making the film that during the year 2016, the whole world changed in exactly what we were just filming. You know, it started in Re Europe with Brexit. You had the Trump administration starting, starting their campaign and coming, coming in. Then you had uh, Duterte in, uh, in the Philippines. Um, but nevertheless, all over the world, even in countries like Switzerland, the reaction of the people is all the same because it seems that we're living in a global um, situation where we feel that somehow the social contract doesn't work anymore. The ones in power that are there to not only to represent us, but also to take care basically uh, of us, that they are not working anymore in the service of the people. And it goes down even to, let's say, situations in a company, you know, where people are abused. Or, uh, and uh, it's a trend that we felt the audience carries in them this deep fear that the world order and their democratic societies can crumble any day. They would not know if they would wake up the next day and everything would go to pieces. It's a bit like you also had it now, you know, you didn't know what will happen tomorrow? What will be the tweet that will, you know, blow up our society? So you had said that, you know, Vlad warned you that basically you and he were gonna become the enemies of the state making this film. Did that end up being true? Were you, did you feel uh, threatened while you were making the film or after you made the film? Um. I think that so many things happen. It was so tense, everything. And basically what we put in the film was the tension and the, the, the drama that we went through while filming. We were aware that we were surveilled. Uh, we organized, our production was professionally organized in a way that our footage was stored every evening on multiple sources, uh, was hidden and so forth. So we were prepared for anything. But I think that at a certain point, they didn't understand what I'm doing, you know, because I was filming things that were hot, but I would not publish them. Uh, and I think they just didn't think at a certain point that a documentary filmmaker that is filming for such a long time, things that are already out in the news uh, might be a danger. But that said, for sure, we were, since the film is out, attacked, uh, that we did a propaganda film for, for him, 
uh, that we, you know, that, that we, we try to, um, because we uncover things, basically we have an agenda. Uh, the Romanian society is as um, divided as most societies in the world right now. So the world changes in something that in whatever you do, even if you do the right thing, you could be, can be sure that many people will attack you, many people will be very violent in attacking you. Uh, and yeah, that's happening, but it's a reality that we have to, to face. And we also have to trust that uh, people can change their minds. People with a bit of distance can maybe one day understand. Do you, um, so what, what do you think was the most difficult, was the difficult part of making the film overall? I think the emotional part, because also being a parent uh, and in observational, you spend a lot of time with your characters and you really, you know, you identify with them, you go through all the emotions with them. And it's very hard, basically it's impossible to wrap your, ha your head around the situation where parents could have uh, rescued their children, they could have flown them out to, to proper burn units and they were lied to that they have the best treatment and they were also basically uh, stopped and they, they were prohibited to, to uh, take their kids out to proper clinics. So I think the feeling of a parent that we could have saved our child, he was taken away from us by people who knew that he will die, who knew that because they are lying, he will die or she will die. Uh, and because in our grief, in our, not grief, but in our um, uh, pain at that time, uh, and uh, in our fear that something could happen, we listened to them for too long. Uh, and that's, I think, where one understands how important it is to have really a free press that works in the service of, of uh, citizens uh, and ask the right questions at the right time and do not leave any room for authorities or politicians to step on, on people's lives. Um, so uh, we, see, we see a few things uh, that Vlad manages to change. Uh, you know, he cleans up that hospital's burn unit and uh, I think Alexander froze. Do we still have, oh, you're still there, okay. Oh, he, cle he cleans up the hospital's burn unit and um, you know, reduces the number of patients that they can take. Did did this disinfectant company who was diluting their uh, the chemicals did they end up closing or yeah. did they they did? Yeah, they had to close. Yeah, they were closed down, and that's also the remarkable thing that you see that it took one whistleblower, so it took one courageous uh, woman to come forward uh, and blow the whistle about the infections that led to discovering this company, that led to closing down this company. So one single person basically rescued hundreds or even thousands of lives and changed the course of the year 2016 uh, in Romania because also the, the press investigations opened up minds. People understood the veil was taken, taken away. So, um, yeah, and all these changes happen basically because, you know, sometimes it starts from just one person, if, if you know, the one person is courageous enough. Uh, also, that Vlad was trying to change the process of how managers of the hospitals get hired. Did that actually work? Was he actually uh, successful in changing that? He was successful in implementing that, but unfortunately, uh, right after, um, the elections were won by the social democrats they reversed it uh, okay. and uh, so now he has again this the same task because he's back uh, to eliminate these politically appointed hospital managers that are basically only appointed by the political parties to rob the state funds to rob the hospital funds uh so has has the 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 newspaper who reported on this scandal, do, do they sort of continue to do that work and, and uh, try to expose corruption in the country? Yeah, 
they, they do, and there was a change. So this, uh, at a certain point, uh, a Swiss media outlet that owns uh, the, the biggest newspaper in Romania wanted to have Tolontan to build up investigative teams and to, to lead this big newspaper. And so he was able to negotiate to to bring over also the, the sports gazette, the Gazeta Sportula. So it's now implemented a, a, a big newspaper. And Tolontan in the last two years built many investigative teams. And right now, also during the pandemic where so much corruption is happening in terms of, you know, uh, uh, PPE equipment acquisitions and, you know, all the corruption that is happening in, during crisis, uh, I would say that they are the main opposition force to the government right now through their investigations. And since we launched the film in Romania, what is very encouraging is that, you know, be before we launched the film, they had, let's say, about 10 leads from whistleblowers, like valid leads towards corruption. And once the film was out and, and it was really seen by a lot of people, it's the most watched film in the country, uh, the number of whistleblowers that they have per day went up from 10 to 120. So people really feel like, okay, we really have to decide which side we are on, decide if we're just, you know, keep just looking on to this corruption. Do you, do you think before you made this film that you felt that documentary and film had the power to, to start a change? It's hard to say, I, I never, you know, I never thought or it's not never my intention to change things when I tell a story. My intention is always to, as a filmmaker, and that's also what drives me to spend so much time with people is like, my question is like, what can I learn from these people? Uh, it's more a question of identity. How do other people behave? Uh, what's the life attitude of other people? How do they overcome things? How do they overcome fear? And in that regard, I think that cinema is about identity. You know, how do we identify with those on the canvas? Uh, and I think every film has to have a very direct and private relationship that every single viewer develops with it. Uh, and then it's up to the audience, let's say, you know, how they go on after they've seen a film. Does it change them? Does it uh, make them ask questions themselves about themselves, about their own life attitude? But I, I think, you know, if you start a film or use, let's say, cinema with the first intention to change things, it might be hard to keep the balance, you know, to, to, to be non-partisan. And I think that's very important. So uh, I'm sure you, of course, uh, and uh, the rest of the world noticed that uh, within the last few weeks, there was a siege on our own Capitol building. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, what's your opinion and the, uh, the opinion of, of Europeans watching this? Is it something that you feel like a lot, a lot of Europeans are familiar with and are saying like, yep, okay, that's, this is the result of, of what happens or do you feel that it's more shocking than that? You know, in Europe, although we, we had the shocks with Brexit and with the whole country being manipulated uh, into, you know, leaving the European Union, which is the worst thing that could have happened to, to, to UK. And we got used to uh, your last president's behavior and knew that America was not anymore this, let's say, strong partner. Uh, the siege was for all of us a shock. We were all, you know, in front of CNN the whole night. We were petrified, we cried. Uh, but, you know, after making this film, I must say that I watched it and I didn't understand why during that nobody's asking the question, how can it happen that these people made it into the capital? So it showed basically more than anything else, I think that um, the way things have to repair, so to be repaired, 
is so much deeper than everybody has thought because the fact that the state institutions, although they knew these people would come, although they knew what would happen, did not protect the capital means that this administration managed to infiltrate the, the state institution with their incompetent, uh, corrupt uh, thugs, basically, uh, so deep. I mean, for, for the, you know, for forces that have to protect society to just stay away, that takes a lot of corrupt people to participate in it that served yes. basically a president that did that. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, we are still concerned, you know, uh, how much the new administration will be able to reverse the damage that has been done inside the institutions. Yeah. I'm always surprised at how much uh, people outside the US are, are interested in our politics, but I think that I have come to understand that it's more uh, ter terrified. People feel terrified about our politics going wrong. It's not just a, like a slight like, hey, what's going on over there? People feel very worried about it. Um, as do I. <laughs> And tomorrow is our inauguration. So I'm just okay, hoping yeah. everything goes okay with that. It will. Uh, let's see uh, what questions we have from the audience. Thank you for talking about the beginning of production. I'm curious whether there are any reenactments or any scenes in the film that are not completely spontaneous. No, they're not. I mean, I'm, I always do. Um, observational uh, filmmaking. Uh, and so, you know, it's one of the core things to do to, uh, for, for example, I never, you know, I never interfere. I, I see my job more as a street photographer that is working all the time in order to capture not only the dramaturgy of what is evolving in, uh, in front of me, but also, uh, you know, to capture the emotion that is in the room and to basically build, as I see it, the, 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 the film inside my head and, and in front, you know, to capture the right things that, that will tell the right story. What's the significance of the trip to the cemetery at, at the end of the film? Uh, why did you choose to end the film with, um, the scene of the family. This is the that scene is the family of one of the club's burn victims, right? Right. It's the first. It's basically the first character that appears in the film that talks about the fact that his son was not allowed to be uh, transferred to a burn unit to Vienna, and that they told him it was a communication error, and said, "My son died because of communication error." Uh, the meaning of it. That's a tough question because. Um, I think the, the meaning is something, uh, you know, it just felt the right thing to do. It, it, it was about the fact that these parents, although so much pain was inflicted on them, so much injustice, uh, I was so surprised when we were filming, they, they did put the song on, which basically they had the memory stick of their son with his playlist in the car all the time listening to the songs. And this was his favorite song. And I felt like this song uh, is not only expressing the identity of these people that still know what is right and what is wrong and, and, and did not become you know, people that look for revenge they still know it's about the way we treat each other. Uh, and I found that it must be the right scene to end the film is because the song in a way is expressing, is wrapping up everything we've seen. So these are the things that happen in observation documentary filmmaking where you know, oh, that's why, why it happened. I mean, it's, it came naturally, that's why it happened because it's basically wrapping up the film. The, the footage at uh, the beginning of the film of, of the fire starting inside the club is really shocking. Was that taken by um, a club goer on a, a cell phone? 
No, but it was that, that that's a, a story because um, there was a, a friend of mine was friends with the band and they shared the studio and he, they asked him if he could film the concert. It was their first concert after they signed with Universal. And they filmed it with five cameras, with several cameramen. Uh, not all of them survived. And my friend also was uh, basically going to die. And I met him by accident uh, when he was out of coma in the office of a friend telling the story. And so I told him like, Mihai, listen, um, I started this film. So don't, would you like to join the band? And he was very courageous because he was also burned and had to do daily sessions to recover his his body. But uh, and uh, although he had all these you know things to do, he learned to do sound and became the sound man of the film. But also a very close collaborator for me. Um, and the footage is basically the footage from the camera a camera that was uh, a wide angle in front of the stage. And the girlfriend of the cameraman who didn't survive just pulled it out by its tripod. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was a small black magic pocket camera. Um, and the uh, memory card survived inside of it. Were you amazed when you saw that, that that, that actually survived the incident? Ooh, it's a hard thing to talk about because when I first saw it, for, for sure, it was so. Um, painful that it was, I, I put it away for many months, basically. I, it, I saw it once and then it was impossible to watch. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, so I'm not su surprised if it, it survived, but um, it was just, it became this big thing like, what do you do with such a footage? Do you use it? Is it fine to use it? Uh, is it ethical to use it? And we had long debates about it. And um, in the end, you know, I also had times where I said, like, no way, we can't do that. It's, but then, then I understood that if, if the viewer doesn't get the same feeling these people had, that your life can change within seconds. It only takes seconds. And you don't know when they hit your life, that you're, that your surviving basically depends on the functioning of the society you're living in. So it made me understand that this will make us think differently about the urgency uh, to make the society around us work and that we can't just always wait or say like, okay, the bad things happen, but you know, what can I do? It's a question that is nowadays, um, we can't ask these questions. We have to do things because it can hit any one of us anytime. So that was the reason why we decided in the end to put it in. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, some, some accidents like this have happened in the United States too, in, you know, illegal clubs that have no fire exits and no safety. Um, but I think when I saw the footage that a lot of people don't have the concept of how fast a, a fire like that can spread. And it's literally seconds, like it's crazy. You just watch the whole, like engulf the whole club and I just couldn't believe it. I was in a club many years ago, a giant club in um, Chicago with hundreds of people in it and someone set off tear gas in there. And it's still one of the most terrifying um things that happened because no we we weren't going to die from the tear gas but we could have easily killed people from the crush of people trying to get out those exits and i yeah. was like i never want to come to one of these clubs again it was very yeah, when scary you're saying that people don't understand how fast these things can spread and and uh, affect your life I think that it, it is also um, the same thing that no one of us thought how fast such a pandemic can spread and we become so dependent on the society. Yes. Around us. Uh, we all thought it's just a thing far away in China. And in no time, we were all in lockdown and realized that people around us are starting to die. 
Uh, how many shooting days did you have on this and, and how many hours of footage? Oh, the shooting days spread over, over a year, I think. It could have been from 100 to 140, I don't know, but you know, some shooting days have one hour, others have 18 hours. So it depends on you know, what is happening. The thing is just that uh, during that time, we were always ready to film. We knew we have to be always ready. So that's maybe the most stressful thing that you have to be aware all the time of what is going on in so different storylines and where should we go? Where do you go when two things happen in parallel? You know, what do you, do you have to cover in, in order to understand the story? And the footage, I think, maybe between 350 and 450 hours. Um, which is a lot. Was, was that a, a difficult process, narrowing down to what would eventually become the movie? Uh, for sure. It was uh, a year over a year of editing. It's, let's say, a medium amount of, of footage for an observational documentary. But, you know, once you go to the editing room, um, you know, for sure, you watch sometimes not all the footage, but you know where your core themes and things are that you have filmed. And then you start to watch the footage and find out what is there in terms of uh, themes, character, and so on. So it's a reevaluation of what you shot and you have to take distance in a way from the moment you shot it and see what is really there. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for being with us to talk about Collective. This was uh, definitely one of my favorite films of 2020. And um, uh, I think that you've probably had a, a whirlwind uh, of press um, and, and talking to people about it. Um, have you had time to develop what you'll be working on next film-wise? Uh, yes, in some way. I mean, I have several things uh, that, you know, we try to, to push and to develop, but for sure, you know, on the one side, we have also the pandemic, uh, then we have to work on, on this film still going on. Uh, and we'll have to see, you know, what, what the one production will be that will take off once uh, we can start again. Well, I'm very excited to see it. Um, the, so the film is uh, already released in the United States, right? Sure, since November, yeah, by Magnolia Pictures and Participant Media. Okay. And it's, is it streaming on a platform or it's just available for on rent? On multiple platforms, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think um, on, you, can, you, can, on the, you can find it on the Magnolia site. Magnolia Pictures website, you can find all the links to the different platforms. And it is also well, Romania's Oscar entry. Oh, oh, that's right. Oh my gosh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I, yeah, I know the film is definitely um, among the um, awards chatter this year. So good luck to you um, on thank that. You and um, thank you so much for being here, Alexander. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you.